True crime, unsolved cases, strange disappearances. Join me as we travel through the timeline of some of the darkest acts in human history. Search and subscribe to The Deadly Countdown wherever you get your podcasts. I'm your host, Kevin Eustace, and together we will look at some of the most unimaginable cases that have ever taken place. Search and subscribe to The Deadly Countdown, launching Friday the 27th of October. Start the clock. Live from Liverpool, the Dark Paranormal, Season 13. Hi everyone and welcome back to the Dark Paranormal, Season 13, Episode 2. First and foremost, a huge thank you to everyone who's reached out following the debut episode last week where we covered the case of the possession of Clara Germana Sele. Now, I know initially there were a few concerns from our listeners that we would just be diving back into the more well-known cases of the paranormal. But not only will we only cover one or two of those experiences this season, we will also make sure that the ones that we do cover are not only the less known ones, but the ones that deserve more of a spotlight. Of all the emails that we did receive regarding last week's debut episode, the main theme was, how have I not heard of this case before? And that's what we'll try and do when we cover an alleged more famous paranormal case. It won't be in league with, say, Amateurville or the Roland Doe case. And, who knows, it may leave you with a feeling of wanting to look into that case even more. And speaking of deep dives into cases and a side plug, you should now be able to search for The Deadly Countdown, the new podcast, wherever you get your podcasts. So, sincerely, thank you for the feedback received so far. But we're only just getting started. And today, on episode two, we revert back to our favourite type of episode our true listener paranormal experiences. Because, as it stands right now, there are only two people who know what the following case is going to entail. And that's myself and the submitter. And I occasionally get quite envious of the listener for what they're about to hear. Because I know how much I enjoyed reading the submission at the time. But before we jump into today's true paranormal experience, we need to, of course, thank our wonderful community over at Patreon. When you sign up to Patreon, not only will you receive these episodes, both ad-free and before everyone else, but you can also receive exclusive access to our Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites. Dark Bites is a show which runs each and every week of the year, even on the downtime between seasons, meaning you never miss your paranormal fix. And not only are there almost 50 hours worth of paranormal experiences over there, they are all for Patreon's ears only, meaning they'll never be on this main feed. Plus, it gives you a hell of a lot of content to binge through. But the best thing about Patreon is the community that we've built over there, It's a wonderful community of like-minded, open-minded paranormal enthusiasts. And we'd collectively like to extend an exclusive invitation just for you. Simply head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. And of course, for each and every new member to our Patreon team, we will give them a shout out at the end of the show as a thank you also. And so if you enjoy the show and would like to support the show, also receive all those ad-free early access releases and, of course, access to the Patreon-only podcast, simply head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. But right now, it's time. And believe me, within this experience, there are some amazing visuals. So I would sit back and close your eyes during this one. 
And so, please, lower the lights, make yourself comfortable, and of course, leave your disbelief at the door, as we hear all about a dark threat. Twenty years ago, I had my eyes opened to an experience, one from which I could not escape. The supposed safety of my childhood home, the comfort of my own bed, well, they became my very own personal nightmare. Retelling my story again and again fell on deaf ears, and marrying my sceptical husband, it eventually closed me off from all things supernatural. Well, to the extent that I'd experienced before. That's until a friend of mine introduced me to your podcast. I love the idea of expressing our true lived experiences without fear of judgment, and, most importantly, points in some of the stories I've listened to have stopped me in my tracks. I felt the words some have spoken. I have physically felt it, because I've lived it. Black, black, not black. A room can go black, not black, black. Someone else wrote this in a story, and I could have cried, as it's the exact description I've used time and time again to describe a room. And the fear. Fear being far too light of a word. My eldest daughter has grown to be sensitive to other things, and I've played them down until she was old enough. We've recently just opened that can of worms, as I shared my experiences openly and honestly. I shared the podcast with my mother, and now both my mother and daughter have been pestering me to share my experience, here, with you and your listeners. In all honesty, like others, I've been so afraid of acknowledging this, revisiting and dissecting it in my mind, to even lay it down on my laptop. Just in the fear that it opens that door. Or even just unlocks it. I will try my best with the timeline, as this will provide an understanding of what may have led up to the situation. My name is Jade, and I'm from Newcastle in the UK. I moved from our home in Bladen to a home my parents bought in a little village called Crawcrook when I was three years old. This was an old pit village, charming, rich in character and old folk tales, a perfect place to both live and grow up. Our home was the End Terrace, around 110 years old, and that was in the early 90s. But I don't ever recall any vibes. I do recall having a natural interest in the unexplainable from a young age, due to my mam having a big interest. I was especially like a sponge for historic landmarks, and, well, living in the northeast of England, I was spoiled for choice with places such as Bamborough Castle, Chillingham Castle, Hadrian's Wall, etc. Feeling that soil, knowing a great battle took place there. I'd feel empathy for children who had lost their parents. I wondered what the trees would say if they could talk. I was a child, and it's only now as an adult, looking back remembering those views and emotions and having admiration for big thoughts and feelings, and for the little weirdo I was. Aside from this, I never actively went poking around into things unexplained. However, I did try to express myself to things I was aware of, especially the older I got. The tingling is how I would refer to it. Now I understand it better as energy. I would feel when someone entered a room, and on occasion I would get the 
tingles and turn to expect my sister or parents and nothing. No one would be there. This began to take me by surprise the older I got, especially as I now associated it with someone being in my company. I also have the occasional dream where I would wake feeling very strong emotions around whatever happened in that dream. I would wake and I'd share my dream with my mum, and to my mum's horror, it would come to pass that whatever I dreamt had taken place. Usually things children shouldn't know or concern themselves with. It's potential information that I've subconsciously absorbed and hidden way down in that iceberg. But honestly, it's still a mystery to me. So yes, I would have described myself as a naturally sensitive child, by nature or nurture. But I was still an innocent child with a naive mind, who thought demons and monsters look like those from Nightmare Before Christmas, ghosts look like Casper, and fear was realising your mam was cooking her famously awful sausage casserole. But there was a fear I remembered from an early year, around two to three years old, and with age, the more my own memory made of this made me accept what true fear was. I would often talk about the worst dream I had was about the smiley man on the stairs. I was living in our house in Bladen and woke up one night unsettled. So I tried to leave my bedroom and... The door was wedged shut and the handle wouldn't budge. I tugged and pulled on the handle and eventually it creaked open. The landing was in darkness, but we had an open staircase, and often my parents would be just at the bottom of the stairs in the living room. So, I took a few feeler steps into the darkness to see if I could see my parents down the... Who's that man? Why is he turning and looking up at me? I don't know him. Why is he stood in the dark, in my home... He's wearing baggy black clothing. He's got a bald head, a pale complexion, and a big smile on his face. His eyes don't match his smile. His eyes look excitable, but his smile looks like he's hiding anger. And he's slowly making his way up the stairs towards me in a calm glide. My little legs understood that this is not usual. I'm not safe. So I ran to the sanctuary of my parents' room, slamming the door behind me and throwing myself into my mam's arms, sobbing about the man on the stairs. She tucked me in on her side of the bed and calmed me down, hugging me close and telling me it was all a dream and that I'm safe now. I eventually began to calm and my blinks grew heavier and I slowly began drifting off when he appeared. There at the top of the door was a section of safety glass and there he was, staring at me, smiling down on me. I just lay perfectly still, thinking, I'm safe, I'm safe, I'm with me mum and dad, he can't get me now. Aside from this, I'd never been one for nightmares as a child, never want to sleepwalk, the occasional sleep-talking, which featured my sister, she would sync up with me, leaving my parents crying laughing, listening to us talk to each other, back and forth, in utter nonsense, collectively, throughout the night. For context, the room I shared with my sister in Crawcrook would see you walk through the door and our bunk bed was in the corner to your left, with a small space behind the door my pillows facing the door, and I was a very light sleeper, so would often be disturbed. I'd wake up mega early watching the clock, knowing the TV would be showing nothing but that bloody god-awful clown for a couple of hours yet. So it was no surprise that one night, 
around eight years old, I woke up through the night. However, there was an outline of a man on the wall at the bottom of my bed. I giggled, thinking, my teddy shadows make it look like a man's on the wall. I picked up my teddies, moving them all, trying to figure out which one was the culprit. But it was none of them. I stared at the wall, confused, and noticed it wasn't completely still, save for the tiniest movement, almost like a breathing motion. Immediately, my brain went to the street. My blinds were already up, as I liked waking up to the sun. Perhaps it was the streetlight casting a shadow. But even in thinking this up, I knew something was off. None of my explanations made sense, and fear began to set in. I decided it might be best to leave the room and go and tell my mam. I wasn't taking any chances using the ladders. They were located where this shadow man was. So I edged myself slowly from my side of the bed, not taking my eyes from that figure. But the second I made the move out of my bed, towards the floor, the figure moved, in a quick tilted motion, as though it reached into its pocket and stood back up. I took my eyes off it, staring at nothing but the door, and ran in the darkness to my parents' room. They, of course, assumed this was yet another bad dream. I, on the other hand, knew this wasn't okay. This was not normal. And whatever it was, I just left my sleeping sister in there with it. Not sorry. In brackets, okay, maybe I am now. Sorry, sis. Close brackets. There was an occasion when I was ten, and my parents were at a house party at the neighbour's opposite. Being the 90s and having our tiny little street, my sister and I were in our rooms, watching the party from our window, laughing, pulling faces at the guests, and eventually falling asleep. Late into the night, a concerned friend approached my mother and asked who the man was walking around our bathroom and through the hallway as he'd seen him through the window a couple of times and didn't recognise him. Well, my mam came running over, ran into the house and looked in every room. But nothing. Nothing but me and my sister, fast asleep in our beds. Well, that was the party over for them. Home time indeed. Another occasion, I'm around 12, and my sister came to the top of the stairs and saw I was stood at the bottom of the stairs, looking at a photo. She shouted my name. Jade! Jade, man! What are you doing? My sister slowly tilted her head, so she could see the side profile of who she thought was me. With a growing panic, she realised this was not me. She ran and screamed into my parents' room, She was a shaking mess, saying she thought I was at the bottom of the stairs, looking at the family picture, but I was right there in that room with her. This event actually brought my mam some comfort. You see, she'd been pregnant before me, and had a feeling it was a girl that sadly never was. And she felt comforted in the idea that it was her Sam. It wasn't really discussed after this, as it was understood we may not understand, but we can trust this was something not to fear. But in the back of my mind, alarms are ringing. Well, what about the man on my wall years before? Was that okay? Was that something that was to be believed? It was real, and my mam said it wasn't. So, was that event not okay? Today's show is sponsored by BetterHelp. In today's society, we're inundated with what's good for your physical health. A good night's sleep, good food, good nutrition. But what happens when you can't get that good night's sleep? 
Every decision you've made that day ruminating around your head. Many of us ignore our mental health either because we're so busy or because it's just not for us. We're not one of those people. Well, I thought that too, but then I started therapy. And let me tell you from first-hand experience, it's completely changed my life. My issue was boundaries. I had none, it turns out, and I wasn't aware of this or the impact it was having on my life. Therapy has given me those boundaries. It's given me tools to deal with those ruminating thoughts. It's allowed me to become a lot calmer within myself. If you've thought even once, would I benefit from therapy, then you 100% should give it a go. And a great option is better help. It's entirely online, it works around your schedule, and a quick questionnaire will match you with a licensed therapist. And you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Trust me, make that first step. Go to betterhelp.com forward slash dark paranormal today and receive 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com forward slash dark paranormal. Fast forward to the weird and wonderful age of 14. Okay, 14 is an utterly awful time for any teen. Amongst the awkward body talks, the heartbreak of boys, and parents, well, being parents. Set out to just ruin my life, I roll. I became quite an extrovert and loved socialising in school. So I was ecstatic when a new girl joined our class, all the way from Alnwick. For the purpose of the story, I'll call her Anna. She was warm and friendly, with an air of mystery about her. Just a beautiful soul I felt magnetised to. She and her mam weren't getting along, so she came to live with her aunt. We became best friends eventually. Incredibly close. But her stories from Alnwick... Wow! She told me of the story she heard growing up there, about witches' trials, hanging trees, and superstitions that she lived by. I was hooked. Something she spoke often about was when her and her other friends used to do the Ouija board, and also write using energy. Yeah, yeah, I thought, we've all been warned about the bad luck they bring, it's basically a game drunken adults pull out just to wind each other up. Remember, I'm 14 here, and I knew everything. Ahem. Until one day, she went on about another random spirit coming through the board. Right, OK, enough. Let's do it. So, with cut-out letters and numbers stuck to the back of a mirror and an upturned Nutella jar, we were all set. By this point, my parents had just converted the loft into my bedroom. Finally, a room I didn't have to share. But allow me to explain the layout quickly, which will come in handy for what's to come. At the bottom of the hallway was a heavy door, and inside the door to the left and left again was the staircase leading up to my space. At the top of the stairs, we had an open banister, with my TV unit against that and facing the stairs was my bed along the back wall. So my bed was always facing those stairs. Anyways, we light some candles, we sit opposite each other, and start asking the question, is anyone there? Well, I felt ridiculous. That's until the glass began to shuffle. Ha ha, hilarious you lass, I sarcastically laughed. Anna just smirked yet didn't look up nor make a noise. Yes, it moved to. Then it began moving in circles again and again, building up speed and force. Stop it, you're scaring me, I snapped. It's not bloody me, she replied. Well, I picked up that glass and I moved everything under my bed. That was enough for me for that day. A few days pass and I spoke to other friends about what me and Anna had gotten up to. And they were amazed. I told them I wasn't convinced it wasn't her. So, obviously, 
they insisted we do it again. For science. Big eye roll. So we did. Like before, we lit the candles, pulled out our makeshift board, and like the blind leading the blind, we went back to looking into the dark. This time round, there was more of a clear response. So I became brave, asking more questions, still not convinced it wasn't my friend. Okay then, who's my crush? I asked. J-O-E. Yeah, okay, that was too easy. It's something Anna would know. But then, it began telling me things. Things about myself. Things that no one would know. Daft, mundane stuff. Like my favourite things. My views on lessons. Family members. This was new and incredibly exciting. And this gave me the confirmation that I needed. All of this was real. Are you still not sure? said Anna. Wait for it, she said, lifting her finger slightly off the glass and asking the board to spin the glass. And with only my finger on the glass and her fingertip, the glass began to turn under our fingers. Yep, sold. After this encounter, this became addictive. I wanted to communicate on a daily basis, and so we did. We had some regular names coming through. Horny Peter was one, and I bet you can only imagine where that name comes from. If they weren't talking about sex, they were making remarks about what they'd do to me if they had a body. But then, unfortunately, there was John Brown. Even writing that name on my laptop knocks me sick 20 years later. He was dark, telling us to go and cry on his grave, located in Wickham, as this would connect him further to me. He told me multiple times he would get me. And every time I'd laugh and remind him who had the body and therefore who had the power and the power to shut down the conversation. Or so I thought. He once pretended to be my beloved granddad, giving his full name and even how he died, and told me what a shit show of a human being I'm becoming. When I questioned if this was John Brown, H A H A H A ha ha ha. Yep, that was John. And yet, I felt so dangerously hooked. I was such a lost soul of a teen to begin with, and right then in that time, the board just made sense. One day, Anna told me she was to meet her mother at the local library, and she would meet me for school lunch. Well, that was the last time I saw her. She apparently made up with her mother, packed up her belongings at her aunt's and left. She wouldn't return my calls or my texts. She was just gone. I was devastated, as was her aunt. After this, I never touched the board again. Nothing made sense. After sulking, I began hanging out with my usual friends again. Going out of the house, I began dating a boy and generally enjoying life. That was until the strangest of things began happening in the house. More specifically, my bedroom. In all honesty, I don't know what started first, but it started small and escalated throughout my ages of 14 to 16. Things would go missing Yeah, okay, I was a messy teenager, but my room was organised chaos. I knew where I'd put things down. Often I'd hear things, not having much of an explanation for it, but I never felt scared. Then, one night, there was an escalation. My friend Claire and I were having a sleepover, chatting about anything and everything. 
we called it a night and got into bed and were lying in silence just about to drift off when all of a sudden a raspy voice said Claire clear as day. Claire responded with what? what? Th that wasn't you. As I responded what the fuck? Well, we both started squealing like pigs and spooning into each other. We eventually built up the courage to put the lights on and spoke about what voice we heard. Like a 60-year-old smoker, a heavy smoker, male. That's how we described it. We weren't that scared anymore, more excited on the fact we both heard it. Crystal clear. I wasn't scared of my room. But I was aware of the fact I had potential visitors. One night, I was asleep on my own. It was a school night and I was asleep, but I was awoken to a raspy voice, again male, saying, Don't give it to you, ma'am. Give it to me. I actually said, What? G give what to you? There was no response. Did I actually just hear that voice again? Did I really just respond to that voice? On my own? Have I actually lost the plot? But there was no fear. I didn't feel any threat. It was more of a comfort, as though someone felt they could reach out. Silly, silly girl. Unfortunately, this was the last time I heard this voice or felt any form of comfort in that room again. On two different occasions, I would wake through the night and emotionally I'd feel fine. But I felt my blood run cold. Like an actual wave of dread from my head to my toes. And I was trembling. It was as though my body was petrified, but my mind wasn't. I would eventually calm down and check my clock. Both times it was 2am. I rationalised it by saying perhaps it's sleep paralysis. However, I soon lost hope in that theory. I began feeling watched in my room. That tingling. I would have my tea or I'd come in from being with friends and I'd go to my room and be fully distracted on my own. And then it would hit me. One night I woke up suddenly. I didn't feel right. Something was off. I checked my phone. 2am. My room had three large safety windows and was gently lit by streetlights. But it felt dark. I tried to roll over and distract myself with thoughts. But suddenly I didn't feel alone. I lay there with my eyes open and the room felt soundproof. But I was on a main road, yet I could hear nothing. A deafening silence. Then the room went dark, like black, black, black. This happened in seconds, and I'd never felt anything like this before, but I felt a threat. My blood ran from my head to my toes, and I screamed for my mam and dad, and they came running up the stairs, turning the lights on, and I was sobbing. Surprisingly, they told me off. Apparently, they'd found out I'd been dabbling with the Ouija board, and they blamed that, saying I was just winding myself up. But they did say I could sleep on their bedroom floor. Over the space of a few months, this happened a few times, frustratingly always when I was alone, and always at 2am. I got so good at recognising this threat, I would wake, check the time, and if it was 2am or just after, well, I wasn't waiting around. I'd wrap my duvet around me like the Michelin man and scurry to my parents' room. I began watching the same DVD every night to get me back to sleep. Not to watch, but just to give me that background noise, to comfort me. One night I woke and the option page on the DVD was open on the TV and the repeat of the same tune was on a loop. 
I lay awake, dreading to check my phone, as I was too tired for all this shit. But yep, just after 2am. But I felt in that moment, I was done being scared. I stubbornly turned over and thought I had to take control. Nothing. No darkening. No silence. And I didn't feel afraid. Maybe this was all I... Three seemingly gentle knocks over by the left of the staircase on the sloped wall. Fuck. That's new. The sweats start. My blood runs cold. It could be anything. It could be the neighbours. But it's the detached area of the house, so there's nothing but roof. It could be the pipes. What bloody pipes? There's none in the roof. You watched your dad build that bloody room. There is nothing on that side of the wall. I click play on the DVD, hoping the familiar sound would soothe me into forgetting that noise and help me settle. Fifteen minutes later, again, three knocks to the left of me, but this time further up the room, closer to my bed. There has to be a reasonable explanation. Maybe I'm just unhinged. That would make a lot more sense than any reality of what's going on right now. Still, I lay trying to calm my breathing, focusing so hard on the lines the actors on the DVD were saying, trying to test myself if I knew what line was coming next. Fifteen minutes later, this time on the wall left of my head. See ya! Back to Michelin Man waddling my way to my parents' room to spend yet another night on their floor. I couldn't believe it. It's found a new way to petrify me. It's won again. I kept telling my parents what was happening and when it was happening, but obviously they didn't believe me. I'm not sure I believed me. It was madness. Shortly after this, we took a trip to Disneyland in Paris. And after a few nights of family fun and amazing night's sleep, we made our way home very late at night. We were all exhausted, and we just threw our bags and headed to our rooms. I threw on my usual DVD and was out cold. But clearly, something really missed me, and decided it was time to play. I woke, and I knew, I just knew, Before I checked my phone, it would already be 2 a.m. It was already silent and black, black. Yes, here we go. But this wasn't the new game of knocking. This was, you're in threat. Get out now. So I done just that. I made my way to my parents' room and made my bed up on the floor on my dad's side. I lay there feeling nothing but exhausted and I was just about to drift off until I heard footsteps. Not down the open stairway, but upstairs to my loft room. I lay unable to move. It was going for me. Then it reached the top of my stairs and stepped into my room onto my vinyl floor. Shoes. Not trainers, shoes. In all of this story, this is the part I find the most frustrating and it could bring me to tears. For how very real it was and the fact only I heard it. It took a few slow steps around my room. It was like a male dress shoe. I could hear the heel-toe, heel-toe, heel-toe in the footsteps. It sounded confident yet in no rush. It walked around to the right side of my bed, stopped, shuffled its feet as if you would swing on a heel to ponder a different direction, then made its way to the left side of the bed. At this point, it's right above my head. I'm not even up there and I'm shaking in sweats. Before it was a feeling, a noise, a sound... But this is a connection to something. Something humanistic. Something in my room is wearing shoes and looking for me. 
I start trying to reach for my dad, whispering his name, trying to grab him, but he wouldn't wake up. Then, suddenly, it sounded as though my floor was being ripped up. There was thumping all above my head. I was crying for my dad, who wouldn't even stare. This was a pure demonstration to show me you can run, but you can't hide. You don't hold any power, little girl. The next day, the sun was shining bright. My parents were already downstairs. I collected my bedding, took a deep breath, and made my way upstairs to see what damage had been done. Nothing. Not a thing out of place. I looked at my floor, looking for scuff marks, anything, but nothing. That happened. I was not going mad. That was real. And it happened right here. Another thing I was sure of was my room. No longer felt like my room. It was now our room. Months went by and the feeling of being watched grew and grew greater and stronger. The black threat nights continued once every couple of weeks. The knocks on the walls that came in threes happened another two times. On all occasions, I would know my place and jump ship. I'd heard what was going to rock up if I was going to stay, and I wasn't about to lie in bed being circled by the shoe guy. I was far too tired and far too low for this unknown battle I was fighting. But as the saying goes, it can only get better, right? One night, I woke and nervously checked my phone. It was a few minutes after 2am. Okay, it's one of those nights, eh? But something was different. I felt anger, frustration, a strength I found and welcomed like an old friend. Game on. Three small knocks by the far left of my room. Okay, okay, you've got this, Jade. Keep going, lass. Fifteen minutes pass. Three small knocks closer up towards my bed again on the left. Stay strong. This is your room. They're so big and so strong, yet they haven't shown themselves to you. Pathetic, really. Fifteen minutes pass. On the slanted walls to the left right by my head. I feel my blood drain to my toes like many times before, but I can't give up. Stand your ground. You're feeding it with your fear. Be brave, Jade. Please keep going. Well, it was the longest 15 minutes of my life, and I've given birth. I focused on my breathing, the voices from the TV, anything that wasn't a knock. 15 minutes come, and then go. I'm checking my phone. 16 minutes. 17 minutes. My God. I've done it. I'm winning. That's literally all it had. Just scare tactics to get me out of the room. But tonight I've won. 20 minutes pass and I start to unclench my jaw, relax my muscles, bring my breathing into a healthy rhythm. I start to close my... Well, that was the wall right behind my head, like two fists banging in pure rage, like it was screaming, hear me now. It was with such force, my bed gave an almighty shake. But I genuinely don't know if this was the shaking from me jumping in fright or if my bed was actually being shook. I dive for the light switch behind me on that wall. Every single spotlight turned off just as it turned on. I began screaming for my mum and dad again and again so I couldn't hear anything but my screaming until they came running into the room. I was in floods of tears telling them everything. Dad gave me another lecture about scaring myself with that bloody Ouija board like the year previous and mum was telling me just to calm down. We'll sort it all out in the morning. She said the lights were probably down to just the electricity tripping and kept reassuring me everything was fine. But I felt defeated. I felt so broken. 
as you can't comprehend the reality and magnitude of what is taking place to anyone. I felt so alone. My dad's not a huge believer and will jump to the most rational explanation for things, even if the words coming out of his mouth don't make the greatest of sense. He's too much of a happy giant child to be able to conceive of the idea there is a darkness around us, one we don't understand. So you can only imagine my reaction when I came down for breakfast the next morning and heard my parents talking about my room. I walked into the kitchen and asked what they were talking about. My mum stood looking concerned, my dad looking puzzled. Nothing, I was just telling your mum. I came down and went to the fuse box, but nothing had tripped. So I went to your room, turned the lights on, and everything came on, my dad said, shaking his head in confusion. It was probably something daft, like a mini blackout in the house. But I know he doesn't have an answer. His face is saying more than his words. Something unexplained he has now witnessed. Even if it's only a tiny piece of my hell, it's confirmation. I'm not mad. Around six months later, my parents separated, and it was rough going in the house, as to be expected in a separation with two teen girls witnessing everything. Dad moved out, so it was just myself, my sister and my mam. Mam had a rough days, but mostly rough nights. In any situation, it's never easy existing with one human for a length of time and then suddenly nothing. But selfishly, I was loving having the opportunity to sleep in my mam's bed every night. We'd stay up late giggling into the night, joking on for the first time in about two years amongst all the family chaos, I felt safe. I felt at ease, restful. One night, just past midnight, me and my mam had one of those giggly chats, and we got on about my room and my past experiences she had, or freaky things that she experienced. I randomly asked if she remembered that dream I had when I was tiny, the one about the smiling man on the stairs. Her face turned serious. That wasn't a dream, Pet, she interjected. What? You came through hysterical about a smiling man on the stairs. You were shaken. It took me ages to calm you down. And you just started to relax and nod off. And you stiffened up again, crying that the smiley man was there. Above the door in the glass. It freaked me out, Jade. I just hugged you tight as I could, telling you no one could hurt you and settling you back to sleep. Your poor tiny body was shaking. I was speechless. I didn't know what to think. Obviously, this opened conversations about other experiences and things going on in my room. She asked me why I avoided that space so much, and joked where I would sleep if she ever got a boyfriend. I broke the warmth and expressed in all seriousness, I felt threatened. Even in daylight, I walk in now, and the closer I get to the top of those stairs, I feel like I had ten sets of eyes on me, staring down at me, in my face. But it never stopped. I would sit down and I would always feel things around me, suffocating me in my space, and nothing made it stop, and no one would believe me. Well, come on then, let's go see, said Mam, smiling. Really? Well, it doesn't happen every night I have someone up there, I replied. Well, I'll never know if we don't go up and spend the night, will I? Come on. She did have a point, I guess. OK, so at this point, you may think I may have gone a little mad. But I was desperate to try anything to stop or even calm the activity. And I'd heard moving furniture about the room, Feng Shui style, 
could help change the energy in an environment. So at this point in time, the bed was at the top of the stairs to the left as you walked in. So the head of the bed was against the banister. We climbed into my bed and just chatted like we normally would. She said it felt okay and nothing was happening, as she predicted. I told her it wasn't 2am yet, and it only happens just after 2am. Well, she fell quiet. Is that the witching hour? She calmly said. The what now? I said, slightly laughing. She went on to tell me about the whole 2am activity thing and how it's meant to be a thing. She didn't know why, but she'd heard it mentioned plenty and assumed I knew, hence why I kept telling her 2am. As though I latched onto this information and became sensitive to the 2am rule. This was absolutely not the case. In fact, I'd never heard of it before in my life. The clock slowly turned 2am, and I joked, showtime. I'm with someone else, though, and I doubt anything would happen. On the other hand, it's not just anyone else, it's my mam. And for the first time ever, I felt welcome to whatever to do its worst. I'm chatting away, and mid-sentence I hear, gently, from somewhere around me. I darted a look at my mam, who's currently lying stiff as a board, like a deer in the headlights. Don't, mam, you're scaring me, I snapped. No sooner had those words left. From behind our heads, someone was stomping up the stairs. I turned to my mam and almost jokingly said, that's not you, is it? She quickly shook her head as we dived under the sheets, and given how we'd spent the evening, we were actually hysterically laughing under those sheets. Finally! Yes, of course it's petrifying, but a parent has just witnessed how bad it is. Mam was hysterical, laughing through sheer fear and panic. She had to ring my sister to come upstairs and turn my bedroom light on, which she did, while shouting how inconsiderate and pathetic we were, before storming back to bed. With Mam now witnessing what I was up against, she was more than happy to give me the green light to have the house blessed. So I met a local reverend who worked in a small shop in the village. He seemed kind and open, and not one to hold judgment. So I reached out. He came around the following week with my man present, and he brought an older female to help him. Both of them were lovely and walked around, saying prayers, splashing the place with holy water. They did agree that my room was a dark place, and so they spent most of their time in there. But, hilariously, they also shared concerns over my sister. In fact, I'd go as far to say they were more concerned of her character rather than the invisible beings with shoes on, banging around the house. And why? Well, she was a goth and had posters of metal bands, pentagon jewellery and a coloured black wooden cross. The more we tried to reassure him the more I felt he was creating his own picture. A picture as to where he felt the darkness in the home was coming from. And that was firmly at my sister's door. So, with that, we seen him to the door. Thanked them politely, and as he held his hand out, my mam shut the door. Cheeky bugger, she said. I always told you she was demonic, I said to my mum. But jokes aside, the house did feel different. My mam commented on it that day. But I felt like we couldn't talk in the house. We took the dog for a walk, and I said I feel as though we've pissed something off. And he may have settled something, but this isn't done. There is still something, waiting, in my room. Sure enough, months went by and the activity started up again. But a few months later, we sold up and left. Leaving my childhood home, I did shed a tear, but I also felt a huge relief. I was in the new home around six months, and my dad was still in possession of the original house, doing it up whilst it was on the market. Passing the house one day with my besties, I realised I still had my key on my keychain. So we snuck in to see how he was getting on. OK, that's a lie. Curiosity killed the cat. 
We walked in broad daylight and it was beautiful. I really felt like I was home again. And we wandered around all the freshly painted rooms, new carpets lining the stairs. Then we made our way upstairs to my old room. It was freshly painted and it looked so big, open, almost welcoming. Until I hit the top of the stairs. Instantly, I felt eyes on me once more. And for the last time, I was out. No more. I left that day and never looked back. The rare occasion I do tell this story, people always ask would I ever go back to visit. The answer is I don't know. I have children myself now, so probably not. They say when you welcome in unknown entities, they can form an attachment. I don't feel this has been the case for me, luckily. I met my husband at 20, and he's a sceptic, so I've never really spoke about anything of the sort. I closed myself off from these things, and I became less sensitive. So you can imagine my hesitation in just writing this up, giving something power through acknowledgement. But, like I said, I'm a sucker for the word no, and I do feel I'm in a good place mentally to be able to shut things out. Things have happened since being in our home. We've lived in here for the last 13 years, but mainly things have happened around our eldest daughter. More unexplained than scary. So for now, ignorance is bliss. And that's working for me. I don't want to publicly disclose the exact location of the home out of respect for those who live there now. But I will note it is now owned, however, it's frequently being put up for rent. Thank you for creating a space to air these experiences. The world isn't as lonely with people who nod to your words answering, Yep, I know, me too. Many thanks, Jade. Wow, Jade, thank you so much for choosing to share your submission with me and our listeners. It's interesting how the witching hour in this case seems to be 2am, and as most of our listeners will know, it's allegedly 3am. But if anyone owns the actual handbook that all paranormal activity needs to stick to, please, can you pass it over to me? But sincerely, Jade, thank you so much for providing your submission for episode 2. Just a quick reminder to everyone that you can now search for the new show, The Deadly Countdown, wherever you get your podcasts. Go over and subscribe to make sure you don't miss out on the season debut next Friday. And of course, before we go, we need to say a huge thank you to our wonderful supporters over at Patreon. Don't forget, if you'd like early, ad-free access to episodes and also access to the Patreon-only podcast, Dark Bites just head over to patreon.com forward slash the dark paranormal. Just like our wonderful new team members have. Heather Anderson, Louis, Ashley Waters, Mr. Los Enu, Paula Berrettini, Tonya Downing, Shane, Carlos Martinez, Jazz, Sean O'Connor, Rowena Green, Jesse Lavender, Roger Van Howe, Jalab, Angelia Crawford, Jesse Vicente, Michael Holt, Matt Bennett, Murr, Cheryl Bozaki, Aria Maribe, Jeremy Estes, Dorothy Silvio, Beanie Mac, April Brumelow, Nicola Antrobus, Olivia Gabriel, Adam Douglas, Rachel Brunner, Brianna, Sarah Desi, Sebastian Berkvist, Jackie G, Starlina, Stephen Downey, Sam Burton, Bad Jokes Gaming, Raw Custom Knives, Nicole Williams, Angela Feltman, Mark Mark Moore, Tony G, Louis Rosado, Hilary Glover, Flav, Mimi Eierberg, Beth Whitaker, Miranda Beale, Tasha Leals, Rhea Dawson, Keith Larkin, Diamond Zelina, Nikki Farrell, Hannah Elliott, Fatterboy Slim, Staley, Leah Sherwood, Michelle Lawson, Anthony Hicks, Dan the Man, Caitlin Hedden, Sheila Mann, Lauren Knight, Nicole Louise, Jeanette Beckenham, Kimberly Starr, Haley Gonzalez, and Nicole Puchalka. Thank you so much, guys. Your support truly means the world. And if you haven't heard your name yet, do not fret. It is on its way, I guarantee you. So... Until next week, please take care. And remember, when you're discussing the paranormal, always try and leave some of your disbelief at the door. And I'll see you next time, right here on The Dark Paranormal.